help me welcome Linnell Cameron. All right. Thank you. You're going to rock it. Thank you. So I don't know if people typically dedicate TED Talks the way they do in books, but I'd like to dedicate this particular talk to someone who has tirelessly and fiercely tried to transform the system here in the Bay Area, and that's Charles McGlashan, who passed away this week. Yeah. He lived what we're all talking about today. The environmental challenges that communities face every day are failures of design. Using the design technology currently available, I believe we can radically transform the built environment and create not just a sustainable, but a restorative future. So before I show you the tools that will help us get there, I want to tell you how I got here. I began hiking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire uh, almost before I could walk. Every summer, my dad led us on backpacking trips, exploring different mountain ranges around the world. Now, we learned the importance of working together as a family, both to survive in the mountains, but also to be stewards of them. We even learned to leave the mountains better than we found them. My dad actually gave us a penny for every five pieces of trash that we picked up along the trail. And we picked up a remarkable amount of trash on, on some days. But as I got older, I began to ask, why was there trash in the mountains? And could a few of us picking up trash piece by piece really make a difference? After college, I spent the next 10 years exploring this intersection between people and their environments, working with mountain communities all around the world, trying to help them understand the impacts of decisions they were making with their resources. And what I found with each community, what they wanted was the same. Ranching communities in Wyoming, Kikuyu people in Kenya, mining communities in West Virginia, and villagers in the Himalaya. They each wanted to support their families and create a better future for their children. Now, in the short term, this often meant, in places like Kenya and Nepal, cutting down trees to cook their food or heat their homes, with the unintended result being landslides, which then drove away tourism, their largest source of revenue. Similarly, mining communities sacrificed personal and environmental health in exchange for subsistence wages, and ranchers in Wyoming subdivided their lands, limiting their own livelihood. Now, just like when I was five as a girl, I began to wonder, why were these communities in this situation in the first place? And was my approach of leading workshop community by community truly the most effective way to reverse this downward spiral? And what I began to realize is that men, much of this environmental degradation that these communities faced was actually the result of design decisions made by big companies far away. Like e-waste, unintended. Or like the impacts of mining for certain materials that are needed for our consumer goods, unintended. But it wasn't until I spent an entire weekend in my trailer in West Virginia reading The Ecology of Commerce that I finally understood that business was not only the problem, but was an important part of the solution. In fact, perhaps the only institution with enough leverage to truly turn things around toward a restorative future. So I did what any other community activist, environmentalist would do 10 years ago. I got an MBA, and I ended up here <laughs> in a sea of cubicles at the largest IT hardware company in the world with a mission to change how products were made. After all, 80% of a product's impact is fixed in the design phase. And what I found was that there were plenty of individuals who had a similar mission, like someone that I'll call Michelle. She's a mountain bike rider, she's a, a Sierra Club member, and a product designer. Now, Michelle's goal was to design better printers that use less energy and are easier to recycle. Despite her personal interests in environmental ethics, environment was still one of many different design criteria that she needed to consider. Manufacturability, cost, performance. 
And then when you look at what does it take to actually design a recyclable printer, you realize it's about choosing the right materials, it's about making parts that snap together, it's about eliminating painted plastics, to say nothing of the whole recycling infrastructure that would be needed. <clears throat> and, uh, let's see. Uh, what Mich and Michelle also needed to communicate her, her decisions and her ideas all across the other individuals in her company, many of whom tend to put environmental impact into the nice-to-have category even today. So what Michelle wanted to do, she couldn't. She couldn't easily design a recyclable printer, she couldn't easily understand the impacts of her design, and she couldn't easily communicate to all the different people in the design chain. So how could we make environmental design easy for all designers, including Michelle. I soon joined a large uh, design software company, believing that the technology and tools that were used to create this world are the same tools that could be used to make it better. So let me show you what I mean. For hundreds of years, designers built physical prototypes out of clay and other materials. It's only in recent years that we've been able to build digital models, like this wind turbine here, and understand how something will work and perform in the real world before actually creating it. So the colors you see here are not tie-dyed. Those indicate points of stress on the model, indicating to a designer where you have extra material that isn't necessary and which parts need to be stronger. The designer now can optimize both for the most highest performing design, but also using the least amount of materials. Now, the technology also enables designers to select the best type of material for a particular design. So in this turbine, wood is used instead of steel for the tower of the turbine, saving enormous amounts of CO2 and energy in the production process, and it turns out it's also more economically viable, again, for the tall towers and easier to transport. Now, when you think about the growth of the wind industry today and the fact that there's 10,000 turbines being added in this country alone, you quickly begin to see that small changes early in the design process can have a big impact. Now, the same technology is also incredibly useful in the context of buildings, as we heard earlier today. Uh, architects and engineers can now build a digital model of their building and understand exactly how it will work and perform how much energy or water it will use. Architects now can rotate a particular building five degrees on a given site or change the shape of that building and quickly understand how that impacts the energy that's required to run that building. And you can compare them across several different scenarios so that you select the best building for your particular design criteria. Now, the technology is also connected to weather data so that designers and design teams can understand the impacts of solar radiation on a particular building, just as they can understand the impacts of daylighting, how that will influence a particular building. They can even understand uh, and visualize what the interior of the building will look like in terms of natural daylighting across the different times of the year, enabling, enabling them to optimize for natural daylight. Now, these same tools are also useful to model existing buildings, not just new construction. So the 200 million buildings on the planet today that are candidates for energy efficiency improvement. And people with very little or no design background, like a facility manager who might be trying to optimize and reduce carbon footprint across this portfolio of buildings, can now upload digital photographs of a particular suite of his buildings he or she can stitch them together to create 3D models, which is enough information for the computer and the software to calculate the energy efficiency and carbon opportunities for that facility manager across his portfolio. So he can now optimize the projects that have the highest efficiency gains, reduce the most carbon, or have the greatest potential for renewable potential, whether that's solar or wind. So the technology is all about improving the systems around us, from products to buildings to even modeling whole cities. 
Many of you, I'm sure, experienced this Doyle Drive construction project on your way here this morning looking for parking, perhaps. Simulations and animations like this enable the designers to understand the basic flow of traffic patterns throughout a particular, particular construction phase, but it also enables them to understand and communicate the impacts of a particular project on the residents, on the commuters, and also on the Presidio grounds itself. So let's go back to Michelle and see how this technology now changes the game for Michelle and what she's able to do as a designer. She now can obviously build a digital model of her printer, innovate and explore different options in the computer. But she's also connected to the world's largest material database um, that exists, which wasn't previously accessible to someone like Michelle. Now harmful materials are flagged for her, and alternatives are proposed so that using the red and green bars here, she can understand which impacts are the greatest and which decisions she needs to make. Now, she also gets reports that quantify the actual benefits and impact of her design decisions so that she can now communicate up and down the design chain. So her, her design now makes sense for the environment, but it also has currency throughout the rest of her company. So what's different here? The tools make informed design decisions easy. The tools enable designers to understand the impacts of what they're designing. And the tools democratize expensive data sets and sophisticated analysis. But what's different is that designers now have access to information and technology to help them make better decisions about literally everything that's built on this planet but it certainly will take more than designers. I am, like many of you here today, I've been trying to make contributions that are big enough to matter, but small enough to accomplish since I was a little girl. And I bet many of you are like me, in that you've been doing very important, but sometimes incremental work, picking up trash piece by piece, leading workshops community by community. As Paul Hawken reminded me just last week, designing a restorative future will require the very best in each of us to step up and leverage the talents and abilities and expertise that we already have inside us if we are to truly transform the system and create a restorative future. So the question that I want to leave you with today is what are you designing? Thank you.